Welcome back to Utah Studies. Today, we're learning about Chapter 10. Let's get into it. All right, so the videos are back. Last time, people did not watch uh, the videos all the way through. So that's your goal, watch these videos and then take the quiz on the next class period. So let's get started. Chapter 10 is called The Territory Prospers. And we're gonna have a big, big, big change to Utah. It's called the Transcontinental Railroad, okay? And it's gonna meet at Promontory Point. You've perhaps learned that already, you might have forgotten, but they definitely want you to know that. And then we'll get into some of the bigger aspects, uh, bigger impacts of the railroad on the life of especially the Native Americans, okay? So, what was the positive impact of the Transcontinental Railroad? Increased economic opportunity. It is easier to export crops, okay? So you have this railroad, you can now sell your products from Utah to the rest of the country. What is one of the negative impacts of the Transcontinental Railroad? Increased economic competition. The rest of the country can now sell their products here in Utah, okay? And then we'll have more towns. We'll have railroad towns. By the way, a quick recap. We had the Mormon, the Mormon pioneers, the Mormon settlements. They're very organized. Then you had mining towns, which were mostly disorganized. And now you'll have railroad towns. All right, what's the first telegraph message coming out of Salt Lake City? That we're loyal to the Union, right? Okay, check this out. This is the Utah Territory. Do you remember where the Utah Territory first came on the map? Compromise of 1850, that's right. And look how it shrinks. Basically what happens is they find something valuable, whether it's silver, gold, or oil, or something, and they cut it off. Why would they do that? Well, unofficially, they probably want to take it away from uh, the Mormon uh, control. That's just what happens. So look at this, Virginia City. Here's the Transcontinental Railroad. It's gonna meet right here in Utah. There's two different sides. There's the Central Pacific, and that starts on the Pacific Ocean and is headed towards the center of the country, and the Union Pacific, and that starts on the East Coast and heads west, okay? And we're not gonna get into all the different, all the different obstacles, but there's two that I want you to know. If you're heading from the East Coast to Utah, What's one of the big obstacles? Okay, you're gonna have to overcome the Native Americans and, the, and you're gonna be on their land. Does that make sense? And if you're in the Central Pacific, you're coming this way, you're gonna have to go over the Sierra Nevada mountains, okay? They both use immigrants, okay? Um, the Union Pacific uses the Irish immigrants primarily and the Central Pacific uses Chinese immigrants. There's, government provides subsidies for this railroad. What's a subsidy? Okay, the government is going to give you money or give you a tax break, or some type of economic incentive to motivate you to do something, okay? So in this case, they're gonna give you 10 square miles next to the track, not you, they're gonna give the railroad companies 10 square miles next to the track as you build your railroad. Okay, they're gonna encourage you to build this railroad. And here you can see the different land grants uh, that the railroads acquire. So in 1862, there's somewhat of a debate between a northern or southern route because the south, it's a lot warmer. The north, it's gonna be harder to build. But what's going on in 1862? Do we remember? The Civil War, okay? And so it's not gonna be built in the south. They're gonna kinda of go for a central line. That's why it's gonna end up here in Utah. You you um, are paid by the mile, so you're gonna to race to lay this track as fast as you can. And then it meets where? Promontory Point, Utah. All right, awesome. Let's talk about the Chinese labor. It's dangerous. You're going through what obstacle? The Sierra Nevada Mountains. If you're going through the Sierra Nevada Mountains, which railroad company do you work for? The Central Pacific, right? Okay, cool. So this is one of the craziest, I think I have it in a video, but in case I don't, this is one of the craziest stories. They would, like, you'd get into, like, a basket. They'd lower you over the side of the hill. You'd have to stick the dynamite, and then they'd pull you back up. Imagine showing up to work. Like, what's your job? What do you want me to do, boss? Oh, can you get in this basket? We're going to lower it over the side of the hill. Boss, that doesn't seem safe. Oh, hold on. We're loading the basket with dynamite right now. Like, whoa, wait a second. That doesn't sound like an OSHA-approved uh, job. Okay, here's a quick video about this.
While the Union Pacific moved west again across the Great Plains, in California, the Central Pacific, after a fast start, had gotten stuck in the Sierra Nevadas. The mountain seemed impenetrable. And to make matters worse, Charles Crocker, whose job it was to break through them, could not seem to hold on to his workers. Three out of five stuck with him just long enough to get a free ride to the railhead, then set out on their own for the Nevada gold fields. His plans called for a workforce of 5,000. He had fewer than 600. Desperate, he suggested to his superintendent of construction, James Strobridge, that he try the Chinese, who were eking out a living working the gold and silver tailings abandoned by others. Strobridge was against it. He thought the Chinese were too small, too frail. They had no experience building railroads. Crocker told Strobridge to give the Chinese a chance. After all, he said, they had built the Great Wall of China. The first Chinese began turning up in early 1865, eager to work. They were already organized into work gangs, each with its own headman. Crocker expected that these fellows would come up there, you know, ones and twos like the other nationalities. And he found that the Chinese sort of marched up there as one group, and all he had to do was to deal with the, um, the foreman of that group. Of course, he would be the clan leader. Before long, 11,000 Chinese were at work on the Central Pacific, and Crocker was advertising for more in China. But hard work alone was no match for the Sierra Nevadas. Strobridge worried that his Central Pacific was falling even further behind in their race with the Union Pacific. And soon armed the Chinese with black powder to blast their way through. It took 500 kegs of it a day, week after week, to carve cuts through the foothills. And then they came up against a face they called Cape Horn, solid rock nearly straight up and down, 2,000 feet above a raging river. There were no footholds, but the Chinese were told to make a ledge in the cliff, wide enough for a train. My grandfather was one of the people that they put in the baskets because he was small and light. And what they did was uh, that they would be lowered over cliffs and they would drill holes and then they'd set the dynamite in them. And then they'd light the dynamite and then they'd pull them up uh, uh, by, these, uh, by the baskets and then they had to get out of there before the dynamite exploded. Huge masses of rock and debris were rent and heaved up in the commotion. Then came the thunders of the explosion like a lightning stroke, reverberating along the hills and canyons as if the whole artillery of heaven was in play. Before the Central Pacific could get through the Sierras, the crews had to gouge out 15 tunnels. They worked in shifts around the clock, but averaged just eight inches a day and they had to keep at it in every kind of weather. Snowstorms, 44 in number, varied in length from a short snow squall to a two-week gale. The heaviest storm of the winter began February 18th at 2 p.m. and snowed steadily until 10 p.m. of the 22nd, during which time Six feet fell. John R. Gills.
Charles Crocker had to punch the line through the Sierras that winter, the winter of 66. And the Chinese then had to build the railroad, lay the tracks. So they built these tunnels under the snow to keep advancing the line. And sometimes there would be snow slides. An entire crews of Chinese would be trapped under tons of snow. And their bodies would be left there and found the following spring. Sometimes the bodies were found with the picks and the shovels still in their hands. No one kept a precise count, but more than 1,200 Chinese died digging and blasting for Charles Crocker and the Central Pacific. When somebody died, you, you just didn't dig a grave for him, put him down in the grave. You, you went to a lot of trouble to get his uh, remains back to the village that he came from. Because a Chinese doesn't want to be buried anywhere. He wants to be buried where his ancestors were buried because he wants to stick together. Finally, in 1868, after three long years of backbreaking, dangerous labor, the Central Pacific crews did what few had believed anyone could do. They broke out of the High Sierras. Welcome back. So here's the transportation recap. You had an ox and cart. It took you months to get out here. Then you have hand carts. It still takes a long time. Then you've got the stagecoach, 14 days. Then you get the railroad. It takes you two days. This opens up everything, not just commerce, but tourism and communications, okay? So that's a big deal. Okay, so what do we see in this photo? Take a second, what do you see? People are on the train and they're shooting the buffalo. So we have these giant buffalo herds in North America. What's going to happen to them? The train is going to decimate the buffaloes. And when you do that, you destroy the Native Americans' way of life, their ability to have substance. Because the buffalo was not only their food, but it was their tent, and it was you know, a variety of things. They used a lot of the animal for different. So you, you, you're getting rid of buffalo, Mart, is what you're doing. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? You can pause it if you'd like, because I'd like you to take a good hard look at this one. Yeah, even the horses look like they're starving, okay? The Native Americans are destroying the railroad track. They know what this railroad means. It means an increase in settlement and an increase in one way of life and a decrease for another way of life, their way of life, okay? Very, very interesting. All right. So make sure you understand how the railroad impacts Utah, positives and negatives. You can sell more stuff, but you have to compete with more stuff as well, okay? Golden Spike, you can read about it on 185 in your book. It's, pretty, it's a pretty entertaining story. Here's a quick video. Intervened and picked Promontory Summit, 56 miles west of Ogden, as the place where the two lines would meet. The race across the west was coming to a close at last. On May 10th, 1869, everything was ready. A telegrapher stood by to signal to both coasts and all points in between the driving of the final spike. To everybody, keep quiet. When the last spike is driven at Promontory Point, we will say done. Don't break the circuit, but watch for the signals of the blows of the hammer. We understand. All are ready in the east. Four spikes. Two gold, one silver, and the fourth a blend of gold, silver, and iron were to be tapped gently into position with a silver maul to mark the occasion. And then a final spike, an ordinary one, but wired to the telegrapher's key was to be hammered into the ground. Almost ready. Oh, Father. Hats off. Prayer God is being of offered. Fathers, we desire to acknowledge thy handiwork in this great work. The spike will soon be driven. Upon us here assembled. 
and that mighty enterprise may be unto us as the Atlantic of thy strength and the Pacific of thy love. Through Jesus the Redeemer, amen. We have got done praying. The spike is about to be presented. The final spike was slid into place. Leland Stanford of the Central Pacific was to have the honor of driving it home. The signal will be three dots for the commencement of the blows. Stanford swung the hammer high above his head, brought it down, and missed. The telegrapher closed the circuit anyway. Done. In Washington, a great cheer went up from the big crowd in front of the telegraph office, and an illuminated ball dropped from the dome of the Capitol. At Independence Hall in Philadelphia... All right, on page 188 and 189, I highly recommend you read it. If I can find a way to cut it out and, I put, the, and put it up, I will. But otherwise, go to your book and read 188 and 189. Read about Powell. He's awesome. Going down the river, it's fantastic. Okay, take a look at this one. If it's the Blue Railroad, it's called what? The Central Pacific. And if it's the red one, it's called what? The Union Pacific. And which one had to, what, the blue one has some, what does it have to go over? What's its major obstacle? Sierra Nevada Mountains, right? Okay, excellent. Uh, look at this picture. Remember we talked about how the train, they're going to decimate the buffalo population? This is not a fun picture to look at. Those are buffalo skulls, though. We're not talking about hunting five buffalo. Okay, that's a lot, of, a lot of buffalo. Today, electricity is going to come to Utah. Okay, we're going to talk about electricity. There's a difference between AC and DC current. AC is alternating current. That's usually the current that comes out your wall. DC is direct current, and that's the current that's like a battery. Okay, does that make sense? Here's a quick video about that. Um, Tesla is who invents alternating current, okay? Nobody invents electricity, but you invent the ways that you produce and then transmit electricity. And he doesn't get uh, as much credit as Edison, but that's okay. So we're talking about Tesla. Edison does direct current. And one of the advantages of alternating current is that you can transmit electricity much, much further. So. To give you sort of an analogy real quick, if you had a, ho a hose and you poured a cup of water in it, think about how much you would have to, how much energy it would take to move that cup of water to the end of the hose. But if the hose was already full and you poured a cup of water in it and then you poured a cup at the other end and it kind of went back and forth, that's alternating electricity. I hope that, uh, from a history guy, I think that was an okay analogy, right? I'm not gonna sit here and pretend I'm some elect electrical engineer. Watch this video. Claimed by many to be the true father of the electric age, brilliant inventor Nikola Tesla discovered the electric alternating current that powers the world as we now know it. Nikola Tesla's invention of the modern AC transmission and distribution system made the electric age possible. Son of a Serbian Orthodox priest, Nikola Tesla was born on July 10, 1856 in Smiljan, Croatia. Tesla received a classical education in Europe he was also said to have been a stereotypical genius who would conceive his inventions in a moment's inspiration. Tesla came to the United States in 1884 and with a letter of recommendation was invited to work in Thomas Edison's laboratories. But soon after they parted ways reportedly because Edison refused to pay Tesla the money that he was owed. Tesla discovered the rotating magnetic field, the basis for his electric alternating current supply system of generators, motors, and transformers. This new system challenged Thomas Edison's direct current electrical system. Tesla's system of transmitting electric current as an alternating current instead of Thomas Edison's direct current enabled us to transmit electricity thousands of miles with minimal loss instead of having to have a power plant every few miles. In 1893, in the World Exposition held in Chicago, Tesla demonstrated his alternating current, and it became the standard for electrical power generation and transmission for the rest of the 20th century and remains the standard today. 
In 1891, Tesla created one of his most famous inventions, his Tesla coil. The Tesla coil was a way of generating extremely high voltages. It was the genesis of the whole idea behind the cathode ray tube, the radio transmitter, radar, and many other technologies. Tesla is also credited with inventing the first working radio, the fluorescent light bulb, the remote control, and the wireless transmission of electricity. He also designed the first hydroelectric generating plant at Niagara Falls. Nikola Tesla died in 1943 at the age of 86. Despite Nikola Tesla's obvious brilliance, he died penniless and practically unknown. It's only recently that we've fully come to appreciate all that he did for us. He was an inventor genius who conceived of things that were way ahead of his time, but are still used today. What event took place at Promontory Point? The railroad came together. Remember Golden Spike? Okay, very good. Okay, we have streetcars now in Utah because of electricity and other household things. Uh, we have a communications revolution going on. Take a look at this. We went from the mail, and it takes months, to the telegraph, to the telephone, and then finally to the internet, okay? Which you guys have had the internet your entire lives. Uh, where do the workers, the immigrant workers for the Central Pacific come from? Okay, China, they're Chinese immigrants, very good. Um, I wanna talk about a company store. Now we usually associate this with Virginia coal miners, but it's also gonna happen out here where you have um, the company store, which means you buy everything from the company store and you get paid from the company and in the end of the day, you end up owing more money for your work. Watch this fun video. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong. You load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul to the company store So finally we're going to end off here with some Native American reservations And you can see uh, in Utah the different tribal lands All right. Remember back about three or four chapters where we had the map with Utah And it was all tribal, different tribal lands And now they have been reduced to how much land that they really own slash control, okay? So that's it for this chapter. Next time you take a little quiz on this. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Take care.